Alrighty, Cherub, so we've talked about um, how to find form, and we've talked about how to break apart the content. Now we're going to talk about the other two and just kind of all of them together and how to take notes in this class. A couple things that you need to know before we get going is the uh, dating conventions uh, and the abbreviations that we're going to use. So typically, uh, I'm sure you're used to our timeline that we use, uh, BC and AD. Okay, these are specifically Christian denominations or markers for time uh, before Christ and Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. Um, we're not going to be using these uh, markers for time. We're going to be using BCE before the Common Era and CE the Common Era. These are more typically used in academia, so that's what we're going to be default to uh, in this class. Uh, if you see a C, a little C down here or a CA, it means circa, it means close to, it means it's about that date, we're not exactly sure, but it's, it's close, okay? So just know that we're going to be using BCE and CE to mark time, and little c, circa, means close. Okay, so now for each piece, you're going to need to know, and this is what you're going to write on the back of each flashcard, you need to know the artist, the title, the date of production, the medium, what it was, what it's made out of, and then the period or culture or style that it was created in. Okay. So again, form, function, content, and context. So those are the identifying markers that you need to know, and these are the specifics that you're going to need to know about each piece. You're going to be able to need to speak intelligently to each of these points. All right. So form, again, is what is what are the objects like? How does the artist arrange the shapes? How does he, how does he arrange the objects of so the composition? And then as well as line, shape, color, value, texture, form, and space. Okay? And you can tell the form just by looking at it. So you don't need any other background information. You can just look at the work of art. Oh, okay. And talk about the texture, talk about the color, talk about the value, talk about the line used. Okay, so you identify by sight. Now the function is what was the object used for? Why was it made? Um, did it stay the same? Did it always have the same use? Or did that use change through time? Because some objects are going to be used differently than what they were made for. Um, sometimes you can look directly at a piece and say, I know what this is for. And sometimes you're going to look at a piece and say, mm, I'm not sure. So we are going to have to do a little bit of research occasionally. Okay, and research in this class is going to look like, and again, AP is really big on this, that they want us to be able to identify um, and break apart information from sources. So we are going to be doing a little bit of reading, a little bit of watching, a little bit of digging to find information on these pieces. Okay, some of them I'm going to spoon feed to you, some you're going to get directly from me, and some of it we're going to have to dig a little bit and find. Okay. The content is what is the object, of, like what's the story that's happening in what's being presented to us, and that, does the interpretation change with different audiences, okay? Again, we can tell the content by sight. We can just look at it and see what are the objects being depicted. Lastly is the context. Now, why was it made? When was it made? For whom was it made? Who bought it? Who sold it? Um, who was the artist? What were they trying to do? What were their aims? What was the geopolitical situation in the world at the time when this piece was made? So um, all of the, that outside information we're going to need to figure out and generally we're going to figure that out by uh, doing some research. Okay, um, So we're going to need to either listen to um, an anecdote that I have to tell about it, or we're going to be looking at um, an article or watching a video. Okay. Now, this is what your notes are going to look like. In your notebook, your notes are going to look like this. 
and I've got this broken down for you. So we've got a picture, and usually in the upper left-hand corner, there's an image of, of the piece itself. And then on the top, there's also the identifying information. So we've got the name, the artist, where it was found, the culture, the date, and the medium. Okay. In the upper right, we're also going to have a map of the continent, and the continents are, or the subcontinent groups, are going to be color-coded for your convenience. Africa's always red. Okay, so if you see red, you know, ah, Africa. Um, North America is orange, South America is yellow, and so on. And you'll see those in your book. So then within the map, then I've highlighted the country, just in case you don't know where Namibia is, I've highlighted it for you. It's right there. Okay, so here in the southwest corner of Africa, that's where Namibia is. That's where this piece was found. All right. So I've broken then the page, each page into form, function, content, and context. The two bottom are context. And I've split it apart just so we could have a little bit more room. So form, again, that visual analysis, that thing we did the very first day with the raft of the Medusa, um, we're looking at, and it has listed here, line, shape, color, value, texture, uh, balance, illusion of depth, etc. Okay, so all those things, how are they used in this piece? Now the function, again, what was it made for? Why was it made? Who paid for it? That goes right here. Content, what do you see within the work? What's the story? What's the symbols? What's the what's happening down here? Um, the context, again, the the all of the outside information, what was going on in the world around the uh, creation of the piece, as well as are there some, AP is going to want us to know, like, are there new or in innovative techniques being used? Are they using new material? Are they using um, old material in a new way? Okay. Was there any science involved in the creation of this piece? Because that's going to happen. And are they sticking with tradition? Or are they breaking tradition? Okay, that's going to be huge. That's going to be super big information that is going to fly directly back to the essays that we're going to have to write. So over here, is it, again, is it receiving any influence? Does it connect to another piece? Does it remind you of, of another piece? How does it change art or how was it changed by previous works? Okay, so over here on the right, this is kind of a compare and contrast to some of the other um, pieces and the other movements within the history of art. And lastly, uh, down the right-hand side of each page, you're going to see a timeline, okay? And it goes from very early up until 2010. And for each piece, then, what I would like you to do is highlight the year, just kind of circle, fill in the time when this was made. So you can see just at a glance, oh, okay, this is super early. This is super late or whatever. Okay. Now we're going to watch this little clip on taking good notes. Hi, I'm Thomas Frank. This is Crash Course Study Skills. And today we're going to look at how to take great notes. You're probably going to want to write that down. <laughs> Why focus on your notes? Well, simply put, when it comes to learning and retaining information, output is just as important as input. When you're first learning a fact or a concept, you're intaking new information. But to retain that information for a long time, you need to store it in a place that you can easily access later on, and you need to put it in your own words. Now, before we talk about specific note-taking systems, what information you should actually record in your notes, and whether or not it's helpful to blend them up and drink them like a milkshake, let's start with what's going to set you up for success in the first place, showing up to class prepared with the right tools. There are three routes you can go in selecting those tools, paper, computer, or arm. What's the best option? Well, unless you're that guy from Memento, we could probably narrow it down to either paper or computer. Between those two, there's been a debate going on for years, but we do have some recent scientific evidence that we can turn to for some hard answers. 
According to a study done at Princeton University in 2014, students who took notes on a 15-minute lecture using a laptop wrote an average of 310 words, while those who wrote on paper only averaged 173. So it seems that typing your notes definitely does give you a speed advantage. The downside to becoming the metaphorical speed racer of note-taking, though, was that these same students were able to recall less information when tested later on. So why does this happen? Well, the root of the problem lies in the fact that the computer note takers were much more likely to record what was being presented word for word. Let's go to the thought bubble. When you're paying attention to a lecture, there are two aspects of the information being presented. Since complex information is communicated through language, be it written or spoken, we get both the syntax, like the letters and sounds that make up the words, as well as the meaning. When you're typing out your notes, the speed advantage enables you to record a much more complete version of what your teacher is saying. However, your working memory, the part of your memory that deals with the information you're currently intaking, can only deal with so much at a time. And current cognitive science research puts that amount at around four bits or chunks of information, which we'll talk about in another video. The combination of that recording speed advantage and your built-in mental processing limit can lead you to devote more mental resources to the syntax of the message, those pesky letters and sounds, and less to the actual meaning. As a result, you learn less in class and you create more work for yourself later on. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So does this mean that a pen and paper always beats your laptop? Well, not necessarily. Now that you know that the speed increase you get through typing has a downside, you can just resolve to type less and pay more attention to the meaning of the message while you're in class. Still, paper does have an implicit advantage as it requires less self-control. Your longhand writing speed automatically limits how much you pay attention to the syntax and, as a bonus, you don't have to worry about being tempted to go on Facebook in the middle of class either. Regardless of what tool you decide to choose, that's why we're going to be taking our notes longhand in our notebook. And so we have a nice, easy place to refer back to them. They're not going to get lost in the shuffle. Um, yeah. Though, make sure you come into class well prepared. If you're using paper, have a well-organized notebook with plenty of blank space, as well as a good quality pen that you enjoy writing with. And if you decide that a computer fits your style better, find a good note-taking app like Evernote or OneNote, Dropbox Paper, or any other that fits your fancy. You should also close out of any apps or websites that aren't relevant to the lecture. They'll help you stay focused, though you still might have to work to ignore that guy in front of you who's taking a BuzzFeed quiz to figure out his Hogwarts house. I'm a Ravenclaw, by the way. Though that's just what a Slytherin would say, isn't it? Anyway, now that you're prepared and equipped with the right tools, what exactly should you be recording with them? After all, you can't just record everything. As the famous mathematician Eric Temple Bell noted, the map is not the thing mapped. Just like a map is useful only if it summarizes and simplifies what it represents, your notes are a useful reviewing tool only when there's a high signal to noise ratio. That means they've got to be packed with the information you need to know for the tests and later application and devoid of anything that doesn't matter. It's a bit hard to make specific recommendations here since there are so many different subjects and classes in which you'll need your note-taking skills. However, we can put forth some general guidelines that will point you in the right direction. First and foremost, gauge each class you're taking early on. Carefully look at the syllabus, pay attention to any study guides or review materials you can get your hands on, and make mental notes about different types of questions you see on early quizzes and tests. Additionally, anytime you hear your professor say something like, this is important, pay attention, and lecture, that's a cue to take extra careful notes. A lot of my friends in school thought I was a cue to take a nap, but they were wrong. Beyond that, whether you're sitting in class or going through a reading assignment in your textbook, you want to pay special attention to things like big ideas, you know, summaries, overviews, or conclusions, bullet lists, like this one, terms and definitions, and examples. And examples are doubly important, especially in classes where you have to apply concepts and formulas to problems, like in math or physics. You can probably remember times when an example presented in class made perfect sense, but then a later homework problem using the same exact concept completely stumped you. There's a big difference between being able to follow along while someone else solves a problem and having the chops to solve it on your own. But by recording every detail of the examples you see in class, as well as making side notes about why the concepts being used work, you'll have a lot more ammunition to work with while you're tackling those homework problems. Now that we've covered the elements of good, useful notes, let's get into the specifics of how to take them. Now there are plenty of note-taking systems out there, each with their own pros and cons, but with this video we're just going to focus on three. The outline method, the Cornell method, and the mind mapping method. The outline method is probably the simplest one of them all, and it's likely the one you're most familiar with. To use it, you just record the details of the lecture or book you're reading in a bullet list. Each main point will be a top-level bullet, and underneath it you'll indent further and further as you add more details and specifics. The syllabus I wrote for this very Crash Course series is a good example of outline-style notes. Each video's outline has several different top-level bullets, followed by several levels of detail. 
yes, this is my actual outline. Now, the outline method is great for creating well-organized notes, but because it's so rigid, you can easily end up with a ton of notes that all look the same. So to prevent that from happening, use formatting tricks to make important details stand out when you're reviewing them later on. For example, in these notes I took during an information systems class, you can see that I've got several details written down underneath prototyping. All of them were important enough to write down, but since the professor specifically mentioned that quick development and low cost were the most important aspects of prototyping, I made sure to bold that line. Next. Okay. So, here's the skinny. Um, we, what we're going to do is we're going to practice annotating um, an article and watching a video and pulling off notes from that. Okay, because normally in class, I'm going to say write this down. Okay? So if, if I'm giving you the specifics on a piece, I'm going to tell you, write this down. This is important. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at an article to find some more information. Okay? We'll come back to that. So again, form, all of these things, function, content. Okay, now style. We're going to come back to what that means later. Right now we're going to practice, okay? So Mona Lisa, we're going to practice with her. Now our picture here, again, it's Mona Lisa. The artist is Da Vinci. It's found in the Louvre, and it was painted in 1503 during the High Italian Renaissance, and it's oil on board, okay? It's oil on wood. Um, that's our pertinent information. Now, if you're at home, what we're going to do is click on either Da Vinci or Mona Lisa over here. What that's going to do is jump us over to an article. Now, in class, we're going to be looking at this article and reading it um, and annotating it here uh, physically. What I want you to do if you're at home, is go to File, make a copy, and it's going to ask you which folder to put it in. I'm going to tell you to put it in, make a new folder, AP Art History. Okay. And then create that folder. I'm not actually going to make my folder, but okay. And then hit OK. Then you will have a copy of this that you can edit in your Google Drive. Okay, and it'll just pop right, right up. It'll be right there. And then what you can do is highlight. Okay, you can highlight your text and pick a color. All right. Now, my recommendation to you, and this is what I'm going to tell them in class, is that um, I want you to um, pick a color that you're going to stick with as your highlight color. So pick a color for form, for function, for content, and for context. All righty. So the easiest thing for me is pink form, yellow function, green content, blue context, whatever though, you do you. Pick a color and then you stick with that uh, from now on, okay? So what we're gonna do then is I want you to take a few minutes, you're gonna pause this video, because I'm just gonna keep talking, but I want you to pause this video, I want you to read this article, and I want you to highlight, see it's real short, real short, just a couple paragraphs. And I'm never going to give you anything that's like pages and pages and pages. It's always going to be short. Um, I want you to read through this and highlight it. If it's talking about form, line, shape, color, value, space, texture, the illusion of depth, all those things, highlight it in your form color. If it's context, then go ahead and highlight it in your context color, content and function. Etc. Does that make sense? Um, so we're going to be highlighting this article and looking at it through that lens.
Okay, so you can see again what I'm doing here is context, function, content. So again, we're just kind of going through here. And then what we're going to do is summarize those things. How can I how can I best because you don't want to again recopy those sentences verbatim. How can you bullet point them within this template? Okay, so form, function, content, context. So real, so quick bullets, easy, digestible information that you can go back and study then later. That's what we're going to want to do. Okay, now let me go back here. So you want to read that article, annotate, and write down on a piece of paper, because this is just practice. If it was real, we'd be doing it in our notebook. And then we're going to do the same thing with Mona Lisa the video. Okay, so let's watch this. The Mona Lisa is widely considered to be the greatest portrait of all time. It appears in countless advertisements, has inspired poetry, sculpture, forgeries, and theft. But seriously, why? The painting is small, only 30 by 21 inches. The color is somber, the background seems desolate and eerie, and the subject isn't anyone historically significant. So what's all the brouhaha about? Is it really all about her mystifying gaze and a quirky smile? Well, let's take a closer look. Da Vinci's greatest innovation here is the relaxed and informal three-quarter pose of the subject. Although Mona Lisa... Okay, so here I would absolutely write that down, three-quarter pose... I mean he's turning that's composition that's form so I would absolutely write that down in form three-quarter pose revolutionary like that's like that's huge okay and that's gonna give us a little more explanation about that this pose may seem commonplace and almost trivial today it was revolutionary in the early 16th century prior portraits were stiff and contrived and mainly consisted of profiles this pose established a new style of portrait painting that is still the de facto standard today, over 500 years later. Okay, so there we go. I would throw that into context, that this broke, especially down in the, um, how did it change art? Or it, it changed art by changing the way that we paint portraits. Makes sense? So I'd throw that one down in context. The pyramidal composition of the portrait is also a da Vinci innovation. Notice the wide base of the painting, which appears heavier than the top. Mona Lisa's hands form the front corner of the pyramid. Your eye is drawn to the top of the painting in that infamous enigmatic smile. And that's absolutely Furthermore, composition most portraits of form. the time were full length. Da Vinci's more intimate cropping was immediately imitated by masters such as Raphael. Sfumato is Italian for blended, with connotations of smoking. Leonardo coined the term to explain his technique of layering translucent layers of color to create the appearance of depth, volume, and form. The blending of colors becomes so subtle that the gradations are hardly perceptible. Okay, so here he's talking um, a technique. Techniques we got listed down in context, so go ahead and put that there. Sfumato down there. You can. Now here's the dirty secret. Sometimes you're like, I'm not sure. Is that content or context? Is that form or? As long as it's down, it's okay. Does that make sense? So fret a little less about if you've got it in the right box, as long as if it's super important that it's down. Okay. Oops. You get the idea. I'm going to post that video down below so you can watch it in its entirety, okay? And that is it for today. So we're just looking at how to take these notes for today. If you've got questions about note taking, shoot me an email and get back to me and um, I'll help you out, okay? Have a great day today and uh, be good, be safe.